Hello friends, welcome to the second session of our ceramics topic. To those who are new here, my name is Dr. Jolsna and through this channel Prosto Hub, I create some of the prosthodontic topics which you might find useful for your university exam preparation. So let's see what we are going to discuss in today's session. So we have discussed till manufacturing of ceramics in our previous session and in today's session we'll be discussing the strengthening of ceramics, the metal ceramic restorations and all ceramic restorations. So before getting into detail, I request everyone to please do like and share my videos. If you are new here, please do subscribe and support me. If you have any queries or feedbacks, you can either comment below this video or you can use this mail ID. So let's start. So coming to methods of strengthening of dental ceramics. So the dental ceramic prosthesis failed to exhibit the strength that we would expect from the high bond forces between atoms because there are numerous minute scratches and other defects present on the surfaces of these material. And also we discussed the drawbacks of ceramics that includes brittleness, low fracture toughness and also low tensile strength. So we need to strengthen these dental ceramics in order to overcome these deficiencies. So here is the uh, illustrated figure that discusses the ways to strengthen ceramics. So there are two steps basically. One is method of strengthening brittle material and methods of designing component. Under methods of strengthening brittle material comes the development of residual compressive stress within the surface of material and interruption of crack propagation through the material. So we will be discussing one by one in detail. So the first method is development of residual compressive stress within the surface of the material. So these residual compressive stress is created by packing the atoms without interatomic space. So when we introduce these residual compressive stress within the surface of glass and ceramic, they gain strength and this helps in neutralizing the tensile stresses developed during service. So basically there are three mechanisms by which you can introduce a residual compressive stress. One is chemical binding or chemical tempering, thermal tempering and thermal compatibility. Let's see one by one. First one is chemical tempering. So here we replace the smaller sodium ions with larger potassium ions. So these potassium ions are 35 percentage larger than the sodium ions and this create larger residual compressive stresses in the surface of the glass and this is also called as ion exchange. So here what we do is basically uh, squeeze in larger potassium ions into the place occupied by smaller sodium ions and that creates residual compressive stress. This is also called as ion stuffing. So here you can see an ion exchange crown and uh, the surface porcelain is strengthened by the crowding of potassium ions which is 35 percentage larger than the sodium ions. So we <coughs> place the ceramic into uh, a bath of molten potassium nitrate and thus we do the ion exchange. Next one is thermal tempering. So here it involves rapid cooling of the restoration surface from the molten state which introduces residual compressive stresses. So this rapid cooling is also called as quenching and it produces a skin of glass surrounding the molten core. And when this core shrink later during solidification, it creates a residual tensile stress in the core and residual compressive stresses within the outer surface, thus strengthening the ceramics. So that is thermal tempering and then comes thermal compatibility which applies to porcelain fused metals. So here the metal and porcelain should be selected with a slight mismatch in their thermal contraction coefficient. So the metal's thermal contraction coefficient should be slightly larger so that the metal contracts slightly more than the porcelain on cooling from the firing temperature. And this mismatch leaves the porcelain in residual compression and provides additional strength for the prosthesis. So usually the difference is 0.5 into 10 raised to minus 6 per degree Celsius and this causes the metal to contract slightly more than the ceramic thus resulting in development of residual compression in the ceramic surface. 
The next method of uh, strengthening of dental ceramics is by interruption of crack propagation through the material, which can be done by dispersion of crystalline phases and also by transformation toughening. So the strength of dental ceramics and also other restorative material is controlled by the size of the cracks or defects that are introduced during processing, production and handling. So in dispersion strengthening, we reinforce ceramics with a dispersed phase of a different material that is capable of hindering a crack from propagating through the material. And dental ceramics which primarily contain a glass phase can be strengthened by increasing the crystal content of alumina, lucite, lithia disilicate, partially stabilized zirconia, etc. And this toughening depends on the crystal type, size, volume fraction, interparticle spacing and also its relative thermal expansion coefficient that is relative to the glass matrix. Next, let us discuss transformation toughening. So when small tough crystals are homogeneously distributed in a glass, then the ceramic structure is toughened and strengthened because the cracks cannot penetrate the fine particles as easily as they can penetrate glass. So the dental ceramic based primarily on zirconia crystals undergo transformation toughening which involves the transformation of zirconium oxide crystals from a tetragonal crystalline phase to a monoclinic phase. So in order to understand this better, we have to know the structure of zirconium oxide. So zirconium oxide crystals are arranged in crystalline cells or mesh that can be categorized in three crystallographic phases that is cubic, tetragonal and monoclinic form. Now, these are the three crystallographic phases. The first one monoclinic which has reduced mechanical performance and upon heating on 1170 degrees Celsius, it transforms to tetragonal crystallographic phase which is a ceramic with improved mechanical properties but an unstable phase and on further heating that is 2370 degrees Celsius it gets converted to the cubic form that is with moderate mechanical properties and you can also see that on heating up there is a volumetric shrinkage whereas on cooling there is volumetric expansion. So this cubic zirconia is used in jewelry and the tetragonal zirconia is used in dental restoration. And because these phase transitions in zirconia have got large volume changes, pure zirconia cannot be used as a high temperature structural ceramic without the process of stabilization. Now let's see what is stabilization. So in stabilization, we add different oxides like yttrium oxide, calcium or magnesium oxide which prevents the polymorphic transformation. So when these oxides are added to zirconia, it allows the tetragonal phase to exist at room temperature and thus resulting in ceramics with exceptional properties like high flexural strength, fracture toughness, high hardness, excellent chemical resistance, etc. So because of these excellent properties, the yttria stabilized zirconia ceramic is sometimes referred to as ceramic steel. Coming to transformation toughening which is a toughening mechanism in zirconia that is resulting from a controlled transformation of the metastable tetragonal phase to a stable monoclinic phase. So when a sufficient stress develops in the tetragonal structure and a crack gets initiated as, as it begins to propagate, the metastable tetragonal crystals next to the crack tip transform to the stable monoclinic form. So here you can see this is the induced crack and the tetragonal crystals at the crack tip gets transformed to the monoclinic ones and this is associated with a volume expansion of 3 to 5 percentage of the grains as we have already said in the previous slide that on cooling there is a volumetric expansion and this leads to compressive stresses at the edge of the induced crack front. So because the monoclinic grains are larger than the tetragonal ones, the crack is impeded and it cannot propagate any further so that the crack propagation gets arrested. So this is called as transformation toughening. So the energy associated with crack propagation is dissipated both in tetragonal monoclinic transformation and also in overcoming the compressive stresses that has developed due to the volume expansion. So the toughening mechanism of crack shielding actually results from the controlled transformation of metastable phase to the 
stable monoclinic phase. Next, coming to the methods of designing components. So here our main aim is to minimize the stress concentration. So we have to minimize the effect of stress racers, which are actually discontinuities in ceramic and metal ceramic structures. And they've got sharp notches that cause the stress concentration. So we have to follow certain design principles in ceramic restorations. For example, um, abrupt changes in shape or thickness in the ceramic surface can act as stress racers and so it should be avoided. Similarly, sharp line angles in preparation are against stress racers. So all the line angles should be well rounded. And also a small particle of porcelain along the internal porcelain margin of a crown induces locally high tensile stress. So the ceramic surface before cementing should be examined carefully for any such small particles. An appropriate selection of stiffer supporting materials reduces the tensile stress in the ceramic. Also, polishing and glazing is very important because it reduces the depth of the surface flaws on the surface of ceramics and thereby increasing the strength of ceramic. And also the fracture toughness of a material that represents the resistance of the material to rapid crack propagation can be increased by certain steps like minimizing the number of porcelain firing cycles. So the purpose of porcelain firing procedure is to densely cinder the particles of powder together and to produce a relatively smooth glassy layer on the surface. But multiple firing can increase the concentration of the leucite crystals which may alter the thermal contraction coefficient of porcelain. So as this thermal contraction coefficient changes, the expansion coefficient also changes. And if there is an expansion mismatch, it can produce stress during cooling, which results in crack formation in the porcelain. So we have to minimize the number of porcelain firing cycles and also design the ceramic FPD processes with greater bulk and broader radius of curvature in order to minimize the magnitude of tensile stresses and also stress concentrations during function. And finally, adhesively bond the ceramic crowns to the tooth structure. So these are the certain design principles that we have to follow in ceramic restoration. Let us discuss about metal ceramic restoration before going into all ceramic ones. So we know that telespathic porcelains are too weak to be used as all ceramic restoration and so should be supported with a metal coping. So these restoration contain metal substructure where a ceramic veneer is applied over it and they are called as metal ceramic restoration otherwise called as porcelain fused to metal restorations. So here the aesthetic qualities of porcelain can be combined with strength and toughness of metal in order to produce restorations that have both a natural tooth like appearance and also having very good mechanical properties. Now the metal substructure is fabricated using conventional casting technique and then this cast metal is subjected to several treatments in order to improve the bond strength with porcelain and onto this metal framework layers of ceramics are added and the first layer applied is the opaque layer that is consisting of the ceramic that is rich in opacifying oxides in order to mask the darkness of the oxidized metal framework. And the next step is the buildup of dentin and enamel, which are translucent ceramics, to obtain an aesthetic appearance similar to that of a natural tooth. And after building up or modeling the porcelain powders, the ceramic metal crown is cindered in a porcelain furnace. Now, the success of PFM restoration actually depends upon the strength of the bond between the porcelain and metal substructure. And this bond can be either a chemical bonding, mechanical bonding or compression bonding. And also the ceramics that are used for these metal ceramic crowns have got an increased alkali content in order to increase the thermal expansion to a level compatible with the metal coping. And also pigments, opacifiers and glasses are added in order to control the fusion temperature, sintering temperature, the thermal contraction coefficient, etc. Coming to the requirements for a metal ceramic system. So the first one is high fusing temperature of the alloy. So the fusing temperature must be substantially higher than the firing temperature of ceramic and solders that are used to join the segments of the bridge. Low fusing temperature of the ceramic. So 
so the fusing temperature of ceramic should be lower so that no distortion of coping takes place during fabrication next the contact angle should be 60 degree or less that is the ceramic must wet the alloy readily when applied as a slurry in order to prevent voids that forms at the interface so that the contact angle should be 60 degree or less next compatible coefficients of thermal expansion of ceramic and metal so that the ceramic does not crack during fabrication so we have already said that the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion for metal should be slightly higher than that of ceramic thus putting the ceramic in compression during cooling next one is adequate stiffness and strength of the alloy core especially important for fixed bridges and posterior crowns so this high stiffness in the alloy reduces stresses in ceramic by reducing deflection and strain next high sag resistant this is also essential as the alloy coppings are relatively thin and so no distortion should occur during firing of the ceramic. The next requirement is accurate casting of the metal coping and finally the adequate design of the restoration. So these are the requirements for a ceramic metal system. However, there are problems associated with metal ceramic restorations like failure of porcelain veneer, uh, cracking, crazing and also separation of porcelain from the underlying substrate discoloration of porcelain due to presence of some alloying elements allergy and staining of gingival tissues etc so these limitations of pfm restorations led to the development of all ceramic restorations with the reinforcement of certain crystalline phases with innovative fabrication techniques finally coming to the all ceramic restorations which are composed exclusively of ceramics such as felspathic porcelain, glass ceramic, alumina core systems and with any combination of these materials. So here we use different types of crystalline phases which influences the physical, mechanical and aesthetic properties. So we have already discussed that if there is more amount of glassy phase, there will be more translucency of ceramics. However, it weakens the structure by decreasing the resistance to crack propagation. On the other hand, more the crystalline phase, better will be the mechanical properties, which in turn would alter the aesthetics. Therefore, it is necessary to optimize both the crystalline and glassy phases in order to attain adequate mechanical and aesthetic properties. And so numerous researchers have attempted reinforcing the ceramics with various crystalline materials using innovative fabrication techniques in order to improve the shortcomings of all ceramic restorations. So we'll be discussing them in detail in our coming slides. Coming to the classification, so we have already discussed the classification of all ceramics in the first session and there we said based on their processing techniques, all ceramic restorations are widely classified into sintered porcelains, castable glass ceramics, slip casted ceramics, heat pressed and injection molded ceramics and machinable ceramics. So this is the detailed classification of all ceramic restoration materials based on their processing technology and we will be discussing one by one along with their recent advances in our coming session. So thank you everyone for watching this session. Please do hit the like button if you have find this video useful and also share my videos among your friends. If you are new to this channel Prosper Hub, please subscribe and support me. And if you have any queries or feedback, you can either comment below this video or you can mail me at this mail ID. So it's a bye from Prosper Hub until our next session.